Welcome to the Disruptor Network Podcast. Welcome back to the Disruptors Network Podcast. We have an amazing guest today. I'm really, really excited about this for a bunch of reasons. But Alan Stein Jr., who's now a keynote speaker, he's an author. He has a book um, right now that just came out a couple of days ago called Stay in Your Game. He has a past book called Raise Your Game. Alan's background actually originally was in, uh, he was a sports trainer. Uh, he, he trained people like Kobe Bryant and Kevin Durant and Steph Curry. He's worked with Coach K, Steve Nash, all these famous people, right? Um, now he's moved on where he's working with companies on how they better their performance and raising their game and now sustaining your game and how to avoid stress and just be better mentally to tackle the next task. But he's got a lot of history with some real people with some real substance. But what I like most about him is that he doesn't stand on that. He kind of stands on what he's doing right now to show you what he could do in the future. So this is going to be a great interview. I hope you guys enjoy it. And here we go, Alan Stein Jr. Ignition, liftoff. Welcome back to the Disruptors Network Podcast. We have an amazing guest today, Alan. I just gave you a really, really good intro, but I'm not going to even do justice to get into some of the questions of, you know, how much you've, you've advanced through not only your keynote speaking, your career as a trainer, um, the book you have out right now, Sustaining Your Game. Um, but welcome to the show. Welcome to Disruptors Network. Oh, it's so awesome to be with you. I've been looking forward to this since we put it on the calendar and, and looking forward to a fun conversation. That's awesome. I mean, you you have such a, a decorated resume at this point, obviously, and I know that your your, your career has started to transition. Um, from, what I, from what I know about the beginning of you know when you started, your early success really came through basketball, through playing in high school, and then in college, and then you kind of went on to that. How did you turn, um, you know, just for a little bit of your history, how did you turn your passion for for basketball into a business? You know, how did you transition from from one to the other? Because you did it pretty quickly. If I had to pick the singular best advice I've ever been given that I I was fortunate to receive as a young person was find something you love, find something you're pretty good at, and then find where those two things intersect. And for me, that was always around the game of basketball. You know, as you just mentioned so perfectly, um, the first portion of my career was spent as a basketball player where I walked, talked, and breathed basketball 24-7. Uh, when I realized that my playing days were going to be over formally when, when I graduated from college, uh, I decided to pursue uh, being a basketball performance coach because it combined my original love of basketball with my newfound love of performance training, strength, conditioning, nutrition, mindset. And, and, and I still felt that this was something I loved and was something I could be pretty good at. You know, I, I've been very thankful. Both of my parents were elementary educators. Um, so I learned and, and was modeled for very early in my life the importance of teaching, uh, communicating, pouring into others, inspiring others. So I figured being a basketball performance coach was the perfect lane for me. And for just over 15 years, it most certainly was. And then I made the recent transition five years ago uh, to become a keynote speaker and work more in the corporate space. But I still never left that original message of find what you love, find what you're good at, and find where those things intersect. And as we age and we get more maturity and more life experience and hopefully more wisdom, that point of intersection will change uh, because we develop new skills and we uncover new passions. So I'm very thankful that my entire life I've been able to devote to doing something that I love and something that I feel like I'm, I'm fairly decent at. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and both of my, te- my parents were elementary school teachers also at some point. So we have, we have that in common, which is really, really cool. That is cool. Uh, um, so, so what was your first job like? Like out of college, you know, I, I know that breaking into that world. I have friends that are, are in that space. And uh, a really good friend of mine is the strength coach for the Tampa Bay Rays. And oh. um, so, but I know that's not an easy space to break into. So when you've got out of college and you, you, you're walking around, like how do you start breaking into that you know, a high level space in, in, that, in that arena? Well, the very first thing I did was I identified that. So I grew up right outside of Washington, DC in a suburb of Maryland. And then and I went and played basketball. It was Elon College at the time. It's now Elon University down in North Carolina. Uh, and as soon as I graduated, I actually moved back to my hometown um, because there was a guy here uh, who was actually training a bunch of NBA players. Um, he, is, he was really close friends with David Falk, the super agent, and was able to train a bunch of the guys that were coming out of Georgetown. So he was working with uh, Alonzo Mourning and Dikembe Mutombo, Allen Iverson. So I figured fresh out of college, I might as well go and try and work for and learn from someone that is doing exactly what it is that I aspire to do one day. Um, so I moved back here and for all intent and purposes, I was basically an intern. I mean, I was an unpaid intern to work for him. Uh, I like to consider myself more of an apprentice uh, yeah. <laughs> than an intern. But, you know, I, I for a year, 
I was basically following him around, observing workouts and doing all of the little things. I mean, I'm sweeping the floor, I'm wiping the equipment down, I'm washing towels, I'm getting guys water. But while I'm doing all of those little things to hopefully help support his mission, I was being able to watch what it took to train high level players. And I was really soaking that up. And, you know, very quickly, uh, he started to give me more responsibility. He, he would let me lead warm ups before the workout. Uh, and then he'd let me spot a guy on an exercise or two. And then eventually he'd let me train one player while he was over here training another player. Uh, and then before too long, he trusted me to train some of his guys when he wasn't available. So it, it escalated very quickly. And within about a year, a year and a half, um, of soaking in all of that experience and knowledge, I just decided to go out on my own and basically start my own training business. So to answer your original question, I've been self-employed my entire life. So other than that stint of basically being an unpaid intern, um, I've always you know, put up my own shingle and run my own business. And I, I ran that training business for 15 years before I started my, my current speaking business. So um, in that regard, I, I never had to apply for a job. I never had to be hired. I just kind of carved my own path. You know, I think you, you dropped a couple of gems in there. And I think one of the things you said, I think is important that you were willing to put in the work free to get the experience. Like, you know, and that'll take me to another story you told and I'll, and I'll get to it. I don't want to get to it too early, but you, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you were willing to, to put that work in to kind of get to the next level because you realized that you needed it. So when you start the business, do you, do you stay in the air, DC area? Is that, be, you know, that being your home, you, you kind of stay in there and start um, going to the high schools, going to the colleges? Like, what does that look like? I, I did. And, and one thing I want to clarify, because I accidentally let it, uh, I, I left it out. While I was kind of being his intern, I was doing personal fitness training on the side to actually earn some money. I mean, yeah. I, with both of my parents being elementary educators, I don't come from money. When I graduated college, I didn't have a dime to my name. Um, so obviously I needed to be able to pay rent and have a car payment and, and certainly eat some food. Uh, so I was doing general fitness population training on the side. So, you know, and I would do that in and around the hours that I was, you know, observing and working and, and following him so you wanted um, to do two jobs to, to, to do what you wanted to do essentially which is great. absolutely and, and and i and i firmly believe that's one of the best paths one can take is identify someone that is doing what it is that you aspire to do do anything you can to learn from them soak up knowledge from them uh, observe them but then you may need to do some other things on the side just to to take care of yourself. So now I'm a big, big fan of, of taking that path. And then to answer your question, I did decide to stay in the DC area. Um, one, to be close to family, certainly. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the Washington DC area is one of the top areas for youth and high school basketball in the United States. Uh, certainly New York City is a Mecca. Yeah, you know, there's areas definitely. of California that are a Mecca. Chicago has great basketball. But, but the DC area is without question, one of the top five markets for youth in high school which is the, what I really wanted to specialize in. You know, I wanted to work with elite level athletes for sure, but my heart was really drawn to working with middle school and high school age players. So that's really when, when I started my training business, it was designed to offer professional level training for middle school and high school age players. And uh, doing that is what allowed me some opportunities to eventually work with some NBA guys. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I won't fast forward too much, but you graduated to working with, um, Kevin Durant and, and, and at, at high level camps where I know you met Kobe Bryant and I went through a lot of those stories and um, the Kobe, Bryant, I'm a huge Kobe guy. Um, so the Kobe Bryant story you told in particular, I thought was really, really awesome. Um, I was envious just to hear that you got to like, it was, I think it was smarter. You're like, Hey, can I just come watch your practice? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and like um, what you saw with that is that with your first interaction with him is that um, you showed up 30 minutes early for a 4 a.m. practice and he was already sweating <laughs> what we took, what we took most out of the story is that you were like blown away that he was, he had worked like 45 minutes or an hour just on basic, like kind of remedial basketball moves that he, you know, that he had mastered, but he was just working on that. Uh, could you just tell a little bit about that story and what, and what that meant to you? Well, yeah, that, that is arguably one of the most important lessons that I ever learned. I mean, I, I shared the first one of the intersection between what you love and what you're good at, but uh, I'd say right next to that, the best piece of advice I ever got was from Kobe himself. When I asked him why he was doing such basic drills, when he was already the most accomplished player in the world, he was the best player in the NBA. Uh, and his answer to that was the reason he's the best player in the world is because he never gets bored with the basics. And that may sound really obvious to, to your audience right now, but for me at that moment, it was a life-changing 
moment because it's when I realized that just because something is basic, it doesn't mean it's easy. Those words are not synonyms. Uh, people often use them interchangeably, but they don't mean the same thing. Just because something is basic doesn't mean that it's easy. And I, I certainly assert that most of the fundamental principles that allow us to become our best selves, the, the, the fundamental basics, if you will, that allow us to achieve, to perform, to succeed, and to be fulfilled are very basic in principle. You know, I, I, could, I could explain them to a group of first graders and they would understand them conceptually, but none of that stuff is easy to do. There is nothing easy about having the discipline and mindset to perform at a high level in whatever industry you're in. There's nothing easy about not letting what goes on in the world around you dictate the world within you. There's nothing easy about living an incredibly happy and fulfilled life. Those things are challenging. And in full transparency, those things still challenge me. I mean, I'm, I'm not speaking from a place of mastery. You know, all of this stuff that I share in my books and I share in my keynotes um, are things that I'm still working on and things that I'm still trying to level up and improve. Now, I can say with a huge smile and great pride that I've made progress in those areas and that I like the path that I'm on and that I do a better job handling those things today than I did three years ago. And I'm confident that if you were to have me on your show two years from now, I would be doing an even better job then than I'm doing at present. So I love the path that I'm on, but I fully recognize that I am a work in progress and I'm under construction and that's never going to change. And, and I'm okay with that because I love the journey and the process. Yeah, I, 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 it's so important what you're saying, because I think, especially with social media now and, and access to all the information that we have, um, I think younger people see the end result and they don't see the work that went into the foundation of that result. And everybody just wants the end result. And, you, you know, it's refreshing to hear somebody like you talking because you're somebody with substance that's kind of been through a lot and, and you, you have a, found, a solid foundation on you. So I think that's really important. And I, and I listened to a commencement speech you made, I think a couple of years ago. Um, and you said two things that really stood out to me in that speech. And the first thing was um, knowledge isn't power. Using your knowledge and putting into action is power. And you spoke about time a lot, uh, how, uh, how we're always on the clock. And, and I, that is, I have two uh, young children, they're eight and six now. And it's, awesome. that's become more apparent with that more than anything because they're growing so fast. But can you speak a little bit about like how you feel about that? For sure. I'll cover both of those. And then I, I want to touch even more on, I'm so glad you went in the direction about detaching from outcomes. I, I would love for, for us to explore that. But first of all, when I was growing up, I can't tell you how many times I heard knowledge is power. I, I even think if I'm not mistaken, there was a PBS commercial for the local library that even came on the TV and said, knowledge is power. Yes, yes. And, and it's not that that's incorrect. It's just that it's incomplete because knowledge in and of itself is not powerful. It's the application of knowledge is where we derive power. Knowing something without doing is utterly useless. You know, knowing something and not putting it into action or executing it isn't going to do anything. You know, a compliment unshared isn't helping anybody. So it's, it's not just what we know, it's what we put into practice. And it's no different than, you know, I've got a, a bookshelf over here with a ton of books. You know, a, a book on my shelf isn't doing me any good until I read it. But just reading, it's not going to do me any good until I actually apply the principles. So I, I want folks to put more of an impetus on execution and action as opposed to just this accumulation of knowledge and then not changing behavior. Uh, and then the second part of, of what I'm, I'm glad you found that resonated with that commencement address is, is time. This, this concept of time, which certainly is finite. You know, I mean, father time is undefeated. Uh, eventually, all of us will run out of time. Um, so it's finite and you can't replenish it. But what goes right alongside with time is energy and energy can be replenished. You know, we can we can replenish our energy by rest and rejuvenation, um, by taking care of ourselves physically, mentally and emotionally. You know, I mean, I'm 46 years old, which is obviously the oldest that I've ever been. Um, but I have more energy now than I've ever had at any time in my life. Uh, and that's because um, of the discipline I have in creating a life and, and a morning and evening routine and systems and processes that allow me to, to replenish that energy. But, but, you know, the thing that's so interesting about time, um, and I even keep this little, uh, this little almost toy hourglass as a reminder here on my desk that when we're born, uh, a, a hypothetical hourglass gets turned over. And there's a few truths about that hourglass. Uh, the first truth is we have no idea how much sand is at the top. You know, you and I have no idea how much longer we're going to be on this planet. 
Now we can hedge our bet and do things to take care of ourselves and make good decisions, which statistically could prolong our life, you know, improve vitality and longevity. But as we all know, especially on the heels of a global pandemic, nothing is guaranteed. This whole thing could be over for me tomorrow. I hope that it isn't. And I want to go on record and saying, I hope that it isn't, but it absolutely could. So we don't know how much sand is at the top. We also can't stop the sand from going to the bottom. You know, you, you mentioned you have an eight and a six-year-old right now, which is amazing. My children are 12 and, and 10 right now. And it, it just seems like it was yesterday that they were eight and six. So in the blink of an eye, it will go by. And, you know, I, I'm sure at this stage, there are things about them being eight and six that you love and you adore. Just be as present as you can, because in the blink of an eye, they're going to be eight and 10. And, and it's, it's, you know, you can't stop that sand. And then the last thing, which... I think we all know intuitively and intellectually, but we often forget once that sand hits the bottom, it's over, it's done. You can't get that sand back. There is nothing I can do to change what happened yesterday, nothing. Now I can learn from what happened yesterday. Uh, I can change my perspective on things that happened yesterday, but I can't get yesterday back. And tomorrow I won't be able to get today back. So the reason I bring those things up is we all know those things. I don't think I said anything right now that caused any of your listeners' heads to explode, but are you designing your life and are you living your life in alignment with those truths of knowing that? And many times, I don't believe people are. And I, again, in full transparency, there have been plenty of times in my life that I haven't been. So I use that as a recalibration tool to do the best I can to get the most out of every day and the most out of every moment for those very specific reasons. Yeah, and, and you mentioned something in there that I heard you speak about a little bit and that's featured a couple other times with it, which is you really focus on being present. And whatever you're doing, you focus on being present in that moment. And, um, you know, that's that's a challenge to me. I think it's a challenge for a lot of people. It's like, yeah. whoever, it, whoever I, 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 I decided to give my time to at that second, you know, I have to be present in that moment. Like, you know, how do you, how have you become better at that? And how we continue to improve it at that specifically, like being present in that moment? Well, the very first step is what you've already taken, and you should be very proud of that, is simply acknowledging it and being aware of the fact that you're often not present. And, yeah. and the same thing for me. Uh, we will never improve something we're oblivious to, and we'll never fix something we're unaware of. So the first step is okay. just acknowledging when you are not present, when your mind wanders, when you are distracted, when you are sitting with someone, but you know that you're thinking about something else. You know, when you find yourself either distracted by the past, what happened yesterday, or you find yourself anxious about the future, what may or may not happen tomorrow, all of those things are taking us away from being in the present moment. So the very first thing you need to do is just have uh, an awareness, a, a, a trigger, if you will, to recognize when you're not present so that you can refocus that lens. And that's really the term that I prefer to use is refocus. Um, I don't believe that it's a realistic expectation in 2022 with all of the distractions that we have around us, especially many of which come from our devices, to have these long, uninterrupted um, periods of, of sustained focus. I don't know that that's realistic. Uh, I, I struggle with that all the time. Yeah, so instead, short. what I try and do is develop an awareness and ability to, to constantly recalibrate and refocus the lens to get back to present. And I might do that a couple dozen times a day. I might be working on something and realize that my mind is somewhere else. And then I just remind myself. And the, the, the phrase that I like to use, uh, I heard from both Nick Saban and from Oprah Winfrey. So it's got to be true. Uh, and that is to learn to be where your feet are. So that's literally what I say to myself. When I find myself not present or distracted or my mind's wandering, uh, I just say, Alan, be where your feet are. Be where your feet are. And that, that zeroes me uh, back in. And yeah, I mean, if... I find there's a lot of things in life that are challenging, but if I had to put one at the top, I would probably put being in the present moment is one of the biggest challenges uh, I face on a daily basis. And yeah, that's, um, that's great advice. I like, just be where your feet are. You're right. Like it's, that's, that's unbelievable advice. And, and a little earlier, you mentioned something else that I, I can attach to this is how do you detach yourself from the outcome of things? Like, how do you not think about the future? Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, be nervous about it. Like, how, you, how do you detach yourself from the outcome of things and just perform or end or be in the moment? Well, part of it is being in the present moment. So here, here's my, here's the way that I now currently approach it. And, and one of the things that I think is really important to mention is something that has really helped me over the last few years in particular is I do my best 
not to label things or judge things as right or wrong or as good or bad. Uh, I find that many times those labels actually um, are more harmful than they do good. So I, I'm not here to tell anyone that the way that I view things is right or is good. It's simply a construct that has been working for me. And I love to share things that work for me in case they can work for other people. But there, there's nothing wrong with having a goal. I, I recommend that people have a goal or a North Star or something that you're pursuing. But what I recommend folks do is once you've decided what that is, and that could be something as esoteric as the person you're trying to become 20 years from now, or that could be a very specific real estate goal that you have, you know, to, to sell a certain number of homes or to reach a certain revenue point for this quarter. There's nothing wrong with having those goals. But in my opinion, once you have those goals, take your focus off of them and put them on the process, put them on the day to day figure out what are the daily behaviors and habits and things that I need to do consistently that will increase the chance that I'll reach that goal. So you're not focused on that goal every day. You're focused on what can I do today to get me a little bit closer to that goal? Or what can I do this week? Or what can I do this month? And when you do so, and when you can learn to actually enjoy the process, when you can love the work, and you're not so worried about whether or not you accomplish your goal, uh, to me, that's, that's coming from a much more powerful place. Uh, because I'm a believer, uh, again, this is simply my perspective, that if you're going to set goals, they should stretch you a little bit. They should be challenging. You know, I, I think I could make a pretty compelling argument that if anyone listening right now accomplishes 100% of their goals 100% of the time, they haven't set high enough goals. Um, so for me, I would say, you know, and, and I, I don't have statistics on it, but I probably accomplish about half of the goals that I set. And, and that's because I'm, I'm really trying to stretch. Well, if my self-worth and my confidence is derived by achievement and is attached to those goals, then that means mathematically half of the time I feel good about myself, half of the time I feel lousy about myself. And I don't want to be on that roller coaster. To me, that's, no, that's not a, a, an enjoyable way to live. What I want to do is be able to say, I love the work. I love the pursuit. I love competing. I love improving. When I hit a goal, wonderful. That's a nice byproduct. It's a beautiful reward. If I fall short of the goal, that's okay. I'm going to learn from this experience. I'm going to figure out maybe what I could do differently next time. And I'm going to, to pursue that goal again, or maybe change the goal. So in other words, I've already won before I've even started that how I feel about myself has nothing to do with whether or not I reach goals or whether or not I achieve. And similar, uh, and this one has been really hard to detach from, how I feel about myself is not attached to external metrics or validation. You know, how, how I feel about myself has nothing to do with how many Instagram followers I have or, 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 or how many zeros I have in my bank account. Those are byproducts. I'm not saying they're not nice to haves and they may even be preferences, um, but that's not what defines me. So for me, kind of getting out of that, that race of constantly chasing something to validate how I feel, it's just insatiable. And in my experience, it's also exhausting. Because as you know, even when you reach a goal, if that's how you identify your self-worth, that feeling of elation is very short-lived. You know, right after you hit that goal, most high performers, you know, before the champagne even dries, start thinking, okay, what's next? What's next? Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. I, I just sold... The, the, the biggest home that I've ever sold, the most expensive home I've ever sold. Great. Now, how can I sell a more expensive one next time? Or, or how can I make a bigger deal next time? Or I just had the best month I've ever had. How can I have a better month next month? And it's not that those goals are wrong. It's just if, if you're always postponing your happiness and fulfillment uh, to the future or your self-worth is tied in to how you achieve in my experience, that's just been a very rocky road. And so I choose not to play that game anymore and try to define these things from the inside out. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And you hit on something there, which I think you'll find a lot of top level athletes and executives and everything else that they get to a goal and it's like, all right, this is great, but we have to do more, right? Like, or, or I won this award, but now I have to win it again. Or, and, and I found myself a lot doing that, like not enjoying moments because I'm, I'm on to the next thing already. Um, and some of that I, I, I think is good because I, I like the process so much mm -hmm. that it's the, like, like you said, the reward isn't, isn't my goal. It's just a byproduct of everything else that's going on because I like the process so much. But, yeah. you know, when, when you're dealing even with corporations right now, you're talking to CEOs and companies, you know, how do you, manage, how do you help them manage that so it's not, um, it doesn't detract from, from, from what they're doing and, and it kind of adds to, to what their future is? 
Oh man, I'm, I'm so glad you went in that direction because you, you, you poked a nice hole in what it was that I was sharing. So I'm glad you're giving me an opportunity to clarify. It's not that I live in this, this artificial Pollyanna, let's all hold hands, kumbaya type of world. Like I have, like I said, there's no problem with having lofty goals. There's nothing wrong with portions of those goals uh, being numbers driven, uh, stats driven, or, or monetarily driven. But I'm also a believer, you know, if, if you're an executive or a CEO or you're running a business, and obviously you're trying to make that business as profitable as possible, especially if it's a public company and you have shareholders and stakeholders uh, to answer to, I still believe the best way to do that is by getting your people to focus on the process. I think the best way to improve productivity and profits is to have a workplace environment that people love coming to work. They enjoy their work. They love being making a maximum contribution. They love being a good teammate. They love helping each other out. They can't wait to get up in the morning and show up to work because they love it so much. So these things are not mutually exclusive. They can absolutely coexist. You, you can have and create the type of work environment that is safe, inclusive, and people love being a part of and still be incredibly profitable. I think it's an archaic mindset to think business needs to be cold and callous and cutthroat in order to get to the top. And that's not the case. And we've even seen that in athletics. You know, the, the, the Bobby Knight approach to coaching wouldn't fly in 2022. You know, that might've worked in the seventies and eighties. And, and I even recognized when I was a child playing basketball, you know, there were things that were a lot different then. Uh, but now I don't think that that is the best way to lead or the best way to hold people accountable. So uh, same thing with, from an individual standpoint, uh, I don't want someone to confuse what I'm saying for being complacent. I am not a complacent person at all. I am competitive. I'm driven. Now I've learned to find contentment in my life where I can enjoy the feeling of being fulfilled or happy or joyful. I don't think that makes me less of a competitive person. I'm just not wrapped up in that. So this is not about putting on the cruise control and just being numb to life. This is about saying, here's what I aspire to achieve. And it is important to me, but that's way off in the distance. I want to focus on what I can do today to make that thing more likely to happen. And I actually want to enjoy what it is that I'm doing. I mean, if, if you were trying to sell me a piece of property or sell me a home right now, and you actually enjoyed the process of learning about me and why this home might be a good fit for me and what it is that I'm looking for, and you enjoy the research of finding some homes in the area I'm trying to move, and you're enjoying this entire process, then you've already won. You're loving the work. And if I happen to buy, which I will more likely do if I'm also enjoying the process and I can tell what it is that you're bringing to the table, that's just a byproduct. But if for any reason I say, you know what, I, I don't think I'm going to buy, I, I think I'm going to go in another direction. All you do is quickly flip the page to the next play. Like that doesn't, that doesn't slow you down a bit because you're not attached. You don't go home that night and go, man, maybe, maybe I'm not as good of a sales professional as I thought I was, yeah. or may, maybe you don't question any of that. You know that you did everything you could to make this work. You were in service of me and tried to, to, to fill my bucket to the best of your ability. And this one just didn't work. No different than missing a shot. You know, when Stephen Curry misses a shot, he wipes that from his memory blank immediately. He's not thinking about it the next time he catches the ball to shoot. That's ancient history. He quickly moves to the next play. So that's, that's kind of my overall approach to detaching from outcomes, learning to love the work, the process, put much more of an impetus on your daily behaviors and your habits instead of what it is that you're achieving. And if you do those things, I actually think you'll achieve at a much higher rate and I actually think you'll smash and surpass the goals you set. You know, I, I want to I want to tell you something too. Just recognizing, just being on this now for thirty minutes with you, is that you fully live in the present and and everything you're speaking. Like I'm asking you a lot of I'm asking you questions, and you haven't once gone back to all well, in my past when I worked with this one, I worked with this one, I did this one. You're like, this is the way, this is how it is, and, and I'm present, and this is how we're moving forward from today. So I recognize that in you more than anything that like you're you're on fully on a path you're not looking backwards at all and you could i mean you know you have the book behind you you have raise your game you have sustain your game now you've done a lot right so it's like you could keep and a lot of times you speak to people they keep going back to what they've done and not what they're doing and i feel like you're talking about what you're doing now and and i appreciate that oh no i, I appreciate you bringing that up that's very they're very kind and thoughtful of you and and i will say as i am this continuous work in progress one of the biggest steps that i've had to take is forgiving my previous self 
from some of the boneheaded decisions that I've made in the past. And, and I think if most people are being honest, they've got a list of things in their past that if given an opportunity, they would have done differently because you know time and, and wisdom and, and life experience is the best teacher. But I've learned to forgive myself for those things because I can't change them. All I can change is my relationship to those things, but I can't change uh, the actual events. And, and one of the things that has helped me, uh, and this, this piggybacks nicely on everything else we've been talking about, is I, I do consider myself a hard driver and, and I aim to be a high performer in every area of my life, but I used to fall victim of being very self-critical. Like I used to beat myself up when I wasn't performing well or similar to what we were just talking about. When I fell short of a goal, I, I would really pile it on. And I found that wasn't helping. Uh, I found that made me miserable. Um, and it just wasn't a great way to pursue life. And, and I found the irony was I consider myself a very empathetic and compassionate human being that, that the way I was talking to my friends and my clients and, and, and my loved ones I was, I was talking with empathy and compassion, but that's not how I was talking to myself. You know, I, I know you and I are, are just now getting acquainted, but let's assume we've been really good friends for 10 years. If you called me up tonight and said, man, uh, I had a really tough day. You know, I, I got in a fight with my wife this morning. We got in a big argument. I had this huge deal that I thought was going to go through and I blew it. Today was a rough day. As your friend, the very first thing I would do was lend some empathy and compassion. I'd say, Ralph, don't worry about it, man. Things are going to be okay. I've got your back. I know today was a low point for you and that's okay. Just know that you have the strength to make this better tomorrow. Like that's how I would talk to you as my friend, but that's not how I was talking to myself. I was piling it on to myself and making myself feel worse. So one of the, the biggest improvements I've made in the last few years is learning how to be compassionate and kind to myself. Realizing, yeah, I made plenty of mistakes in my 20s and 30s, uh, not even counting my teenage years, plenty of mistakes. But at that time, I was doing the best that I could with the tools that I had. I just yeah. didn't have as many tools back then as I'd like to believe I have now. You know, if, if the only tool you have in your toolbox is a hammer, then everything in the world looks like a nail. Like you don't have very many options. But if you also have a wrench and a screwdriver and a saw and some pliers, uh, now you have more options. And that's really how I look at the 46 year old Alan versus the 26 year old Alan. I have a lot more tools in my toolbox that I can use. And, and, and that's also been very helpful in how I deal with, with others. I make the assumption that everyone in the world is doing the best they can with the information they have. They're doing the best they can with their current level of awareness. So even when someone says or does something that I think is either absurd or abhorrent, I don't judge them for it. I realize that with the information they have, they actually think that's a good decision or they think that's a smart thing to say or do. They're doing the best that they can. And, and that's all that I'm trying to do. And that actually helps draw me closer to other human beings as opposed to being much more divisive, which I think we've seen an explosion of over the last couple of years, uh, divisiveness. Now, one last thing, and I know this was a mouthful. This doesn't mean that I approve of what other people say or do. It doesn't mean that I share their beliefs. It just means that I can come to a common ground of they're doing the best they can. And, and think about this. Uh, I mean, you and I are, are roughly in the same demographic, but, yeah. but we still come from very different backgrounds. Uh, you were raised in a different area of the country than I was raised. I know we said that our parents were both elementary educators, but you and I were probably raised slightly differently. Our parents probably taught us things slightly differently. You know, I, I don't know any more about you, but you, you may have different political or religious beliefs than maybe I was accustomed to. You may read, watch, and listen to different uh, sources or, or things on social media than I may listen to. Uh, the people that you're closest with, your inner circle of friends might have different beliefs than I have or my friends have, and that's okay. So why, if you've been, if you've gone through life with a completely different set of information than I have, how could I possibly be surprised that you and I view something differently? Good point. Yeah. Like it, it, it's okay. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. And this again is where I try to remove the label of right or wrong, because what I find a lot of people do is they look at their beliefs and perspectives. These are not facts. These are not truths. These are simply a perspective, but they treat them as if what I'm saying is good and what you're saying is bad. What I believe is right and what you believe is wrong. And I find that that is an incredibly arrogant and self-righteous perspective to have. And it only creates more divide. 
And, and I'm about bringing people together, being inclusive and, and, and trying to remove that divide. Um, and I think the humility of stepping aside and saying, you believe what you believe for very good reason. I believe what I believe for very good reason. Maybe we can have a, a dispassionate, civil and respectful conversation about it. Yeah, you gave some awesome stuff there, right? So um, one thing you said, I think is, is you like, I look back, I went through the 2007, 2008 market crash in this business. And I really, uh, lost, I had a, a pretty fast rise and then I lost everything. Um, and I, you know, for a lot of times when I used to tell the, the, the story about that, I used to be like, yeah, I screwed up. Uh, you know, I, I was overextended. I was doing th this, but I realized for what you said, what you said, but I realized that recently is that I actually didn't screw up. I was just doing the best I can with what I had. I didn't have any knowledge. I had no background in it. So there was really no way for me to, to avoid what was coming. But I just did the best with what I had. So, and I learned a lot of good lessons from, but I think that's, you know, for people who have that more traumatic situations than that in their background, I think it's okay to forgive yourself for that because you're right. Like, we don't know, you know, that, you know, you, you only can function on what you have knowledge of and you can, and you, and you can, and that's why, again, I'll go back to this again. Speaking to somebody like you who has substance, who's been through a lot of life experience and gets to this point is great because being a human being is almost like a craft. Like we get better at the craft as we get older, right? So like you're continuing to improve your craft and you're able to share that in different ways to other people. So I, you gave them really, really a, a couple of good things in there that um, I think people should highlight. So, you know, Ellen, in, in your books, in, 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 raise, in Raise Your Game and now in Sustain Your Game, which is, is, is that out, you know, that's coming out? No, it came out, uh, as the time of this recording, it came out two days ago, it came out oh, this past awesome. Tuesday, April 12th. So it's, it's live and ready to roll. Congratulations. What, what, how have you grown from the first book you wrote to, to this? Like, what is the difference in it? Or is it just an extension of that? It's a little bit of both. Like I choose to write about things that I'm actually currently experiencing. So when I wrote Raise Your Game, um, the focus was on how do I reach optimal performance? Now, uh, to clarify, I'm not claiming that I've reached the top of the mountain. I'm still on the climb. But while I've been on that climb, it, it became very apparent to me that, that reaching the top of that mountain in any area of your life is only part of the battle. Staying there is even harder. I mean, even in the NBA, when I would have the chance to work with rookies, the, the stat we would use all the time, do you know the average career in the NBA is three and a half years? That's really, really short. Yeah. I mean, that again is what makes what LeBron James is doing that much more remarkable that, that he's been the king for almost two decades. Crazy. But so we would say that with a smile because these folks that are now rookies in the NBA, they've spent their entire lives trying to get to this, this pinnacle. And we would say, look, you should be very proud that you made it, that you just got drafted. It's a huge accomplishment, but the hard work really starts now. You know, we would say this with a lovingly, a loving smile. You actually did the easy part, which is making the MBA. Now it's time for the real challenge, which is staying there. And, and I found that when I reach a certain level of success, in order to stay there, the biggest three things that combat that are the main focal points of sustain your game, which is stress, stagnation, and burnout. If you can come up with strategies and approaches to alleviate stress, stagnation, and burnout, then you have a very good chance of not only sustaining excellence and high performance, which of course is important, but also sustaining fulfillment. You know, that that's to me, one of the most important parts of, of the whole thing. It's not just being successful, it's enjoying that success and enjoying the ride. And, you know, I, I think most people that know me and maybe even you've gotten a sense of this, I'm, I'm a very optimistic guy. I believe the future is very bright. You know, I'm 46 years old and I have learned a ton over these first 46 years. And I'm so excited and optimistic about applying everything I've learned to the next 46 years. Now, as we established with our time analogy, I know that that's not promised. I don't know that I'm going to have 46 more years uh, on this earth. I'm going to live and behave as if I do. I'm going to take care of myself physically, mentally, and emotionally to increase the chance that I do. But I want to take everything that I've learned. You know, if the first 46 were, were pretty good, the next 46 are going to be absolutely amazing because I'm going to continue this, this path of growth uh, and improvement. And for me, that's what gives me optimism. I know that over the next 46 years, I'm going to face massive adversity personally, professionally, and even in the world, you know, you know, I mean, based on our age, we've both lived through 9-11 and we've both lived through the COVID-19 pandemic, yeah. two, two massive adversities. I understand the fact there's probably another thing like that going to happen five, 10, 20 years from now. If I live another 46 years, 
there's going to be something else that is going to really chest, uh, test our society, but I'll be prepared for that. You know, I think the best thing that you could have probably learned, uh, having gone through what you went through in the two, 2007 crash was, hey, I, I had the skills to build this up the first time. I have the skills to build it up again. Like, it's not my preference. I wish that the rug didn't get pulled out from under me, but I can do this. And, and that's how I look at this. You know, whether it's, it's 9-11 or the COVID-19 pandemic, I was able to develop the type of mindsets and skill sets to still thrive in the face of massive adversity. And I know that I'll be able to do that again when something else arises. Yeah, that, that's, you're hundred percent right. And, and uh, you know, again, not knowing each other that well, you're getting a lot of things out of me that are true. You're right. I, I think what I learned from past mistakes is that um, nothing broke me, right? So I, I could, it, it, whatever I did to recover, I could do again. And I think that's what takes the fear out of it. Um, yeah. I don't fear being broke. I don't fear being uh, in, in, in despair that way, because I know that I, I got past it, I got past it again. So I think for other people in reading your book, you know, that would be something great to get out of it, right? Like forgive yourself for what you did before. And this is how you can avoid it in the future and sustain what you have going forward. But uh, I, I love it. Um, so I'm an avid reader. So I'm definitely going to pick your book up now that it's out, by the way, right now. I'm gonna say, and, and my commitment to you is the next time we speak that I will have I will have some more feedback for you for, to sustain your book because sustain awesome. your game because I think it's uh, I think your message is powerful in just speaking to you. Well, well, thank you, and I hope you find it helpful. And I, one thing I want to highlight that you just said, which is so important, um, it's not the events that occur that are most important; it's our response to those events. You know, you had zero control over the market crashing in two thousand seven. Zero. You had zero control over the global pandemic we've just experienced zero, but you absolutely had control over how you were going to respond to both of those uh, adversities. You know, were you going to dwell on the past? Were you going to beat your, I'm talking about the 2007 experience. Sure. Were you going to dwell on the past? Were you going to beat yourself up for overextending yourself? Or were you going to give yourself some grace and go, you know what, if I had to do it over again, I, I might do things differently with the information I have now, but I had the skill sets to build it once and I can certainly build it again. And this time I can build it even better and bigger because I know more. I have more experience. I learned from that situation. And I don't say this stuff casually. Uh, I'm not saying that the market crash or 9-11 or, or the COVID-19 pandemic weren't absolutely catastrophic in many areas and were incredibly adverse and challenging. And I'm not saying any of this stuff is easy. I'm just saying when you can have an acceptance over the fact that you don't control those things, but you can empower yourself in your response, then you keep the keys to the car. Like you're the one doing the driving. And to me, that's what's most important. So um, I don't spend much time worrying about circumstances, events, what people say, what people do. I put all of my focus, time, and energy into my response to those things. And I certainly have my preferences. Yeah. I would have preferred that we did not go through a two-year global pandemic. That was a preference. But I would also prefer that it's sunny out instead of raining. But that doesn't mean I'm going to have a bad day when it yeah. rains. That simply means this isn't my preference. It's not the universe's job to line up exactly the way that I want it. The, the world's going to do what the world's going to do, and I get to choose my response. And that's what I'm hoping somebody pulls from either one of my books, is to feel liberated and empowered by the fact that you choose your response. Plenty of things in life are going to happen that you don't like, that you don't agree with, that you don't prefer, things that can be really, really hard, death of a loved one, losing a job. I'm in no means saying those things are easy to deal with, but on some level, you get to choose your response to those things. You know, you get to choose how you're going to live your life moving forward. And uh, that's the place that I'm trying to come from. And some days I do a really great job with that. Other days, not so much. And on the days that I don't, I've learned to give myself some space and some grace. Well, and it just, you brought another question to my mind, just saying that during the pandemic, because obviously, again, we don't choose this. We kind of got stuck in whatever it is. I mean, did you choose that time to write this book? Was that part of your process during that time? Like, what, like, the, was that your progress during that time? At 100%. I mean, the, the seed had been planted that this was a book concept that I wanted to do, but the pandemic actually gave me a lot more discretionary time to put pen to paper um, because I wasn't traveling speaking. I was doing virtual engagements, but I had a lot more time. And I realized that stress, stagnation, and burnout started to exponentially go through the roof during the pandemic. Those things were heightened. I mean, everybody's collective stress level went up tenfold once we were all in lockdown and quarantine. Uh, people's ability to just kind of put on the mental cruise control and say fine is just fine and stagnate 
was going through the roof. And then there were tons of people that started to feel burned out. Um, because when we left kind of the conventional working world of a lot of people reporting to a physical office each day and then closing their laptops and going home at night, those lines got blurred when people started working remotely because people were expected to be on all of the time. I mean, there was no such thing as nine to five anymore. It was like, hey, you know, you're accessible 24 seven. You should be right. answering texts, emails and on Zoom calls 24 seven. And I think people really started to experience some burnout. So um, that was a silver lining of the pandemic. It allowed me to refocus my lens and spend more time writing something that I, I'm, I'm certainly hoping people find helpful. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Man. Um, you know, I think just the message you're putting out in the world right now is helpful, and, and I appreciate it. And, and, and I took a lot from our conversation today. If somebody wanted to speak to you, um, you know, I know that you have your own personal website and you have the, the, the website for the book, which is sustainyourgamebook.com. But where would be the best place to get in touch with you or find more, more from you? Uh, allensteinjr.com is kind of the major central hub. Um, and that's primarily all of my speaking offerings. I also have a supplementary site called strongerteam.com. Uh, I have information there on, on a course, on one-on-one -on -one coaching, on a podcast, on a newsletter, and certainly information on the book. So kind of everything in and around speaking can be found at strongerteam.com. Everything speaking related at allensteinjr.com. And yeah, if someone's interested in the book, um, you can go to sustainyourgamebook.com or you can search for either book on Amazon or Audible. I did the reads for both audio books. Awesome. And I'm also at Alan Stein Jr. on the major social platforms. I love engaging with folks. Um, so if anyone listening, if, if you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did and you want to ask a question, uh, if you want to debate or challenge something I said, <laughs> or you just want to simply reach out to introduce yourself, just shoot me a DM on Instagram. I'm really good about getting back to folks and uh, always love keeping the conversation going because this this was a lot of fun, man. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, you're awesome. Uh, I, I, this was great. And uh, I took a ton from it. I love that you did an audio book because I'm an audio guy. So I'm going to I'm gonna get it. I just finishing something. So I'm, it's going to be my next book. But cool. thank you for coming. Uh, this was great. Uh, I hope to hear more from you in the future and, and we'll look out for whatever you're working on. I would love that. Let's definitely stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate it. What a great podcast that was. I hope everybody really, really enjoyed it. You know, uh, I had a lot of questions to ask him about basketball players and that kind of stuff. And I didn't really even get a chance to get into it because what Alan's message was so strong about what he's doing today and how he's making, he's optimizing himself as a human being today and how he's forgiving himself for his past mistakes and using them as strength to go forward. So I hope everybody got a, a lot of that because I know I did. It spoke really, really to a lot of what I'm working on now, a lot of what I've gone through in the past. Uh, but if you want to hear any more of our podcasts, they're on all the platforms, Apple, Spotify, Anchor. They're also on our website, disruptorsnetwork.com and our YouTube channel. You can see the live videos of all the stuff that's going on here. And that's Disruptors Network on YouTube. I'm Ralph Dubugnar. You can catch me at Debug. It's D-I-B-U-G on Instagram. And hope to see you guys again soon.